All right, good morning, everyone. Um, <clears throat> Thank you all for joining us today for uh, the first hybrid UCSF Liver Center seminar. Um, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Professor Anskar Los. Um, just as a quick housekeeping note, uh, because we have sort of an in-house in live audience today, as well as a Zoom audience, um, we're going to take questions in the chat. Um, <clears throat> Uh, so feel free as you think of questions to just type them into the Zoom chat if you're doing this virtually. Um, otherwise, at the end of the talk, we'll take questions, um, at which point folks in the audience can raise their hand. Uh, people over Zoom can just unmute or use the raise hand function. So lots of lots of options. Uh, Dr. Los has studied across the globe, uh, spending time in Wales, London, Israel, and Boston at different times in his career um, on various scholarships and scholarly exchanges. He has received degrees in medicine and philosophy from the George August University in Göttingen, Germany. Dr. Losa has held many prestigious positions, including deputy head of the Department of Medicine um, at Johannes Gutenberg University in Mainz, Germany. He's currently the director of the Department of Medicine, which includes gastroenterology, hepatology, and infectious and tropical diseases at the University Medical Center, Hamburg, Eppendorf. I won't recount here his multitude of accomplishments, but suffice it to say, he has published prolifically, um, has extensive clinical trial experience, and has been awarded numerous honors. He's the spokesperson of a large research consortium on liver inflammation and another one on PSC, both funded by the German Research Foundation. Um, Dr. Losa uh, led the group that wrote the EASL guidelines on autoimmune hepatitis, and he leads the European Reference Network's initiative for rare liver diseases, known as ERN rare liver. Ansgar was also a member of the Global Outreach Subcommittee of the Cholestatic and Autoimmune Liver Diseases Special Interest Group of AASLD, where I had the opportunity to work with him. Um, Ansgar has mentored and sponsored numerous junior physicians and scientists internationally. What really stands out to me is that Ansgar has achieved so much professionally and has contributed an incredible amount to the field of autoimmune liver diseases and internal medicine broadly. And he remains a kind and humble person whom I'm honored to call a collaborator and friend. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Ansgar Los to UCSF. Thank you, Michelle, and it's a great pleasure to be here. It's a great honor to, to be the first speaker at an on-site um, hybrid meeting. And of course, it's an, an honor to be uh, the speaker following uh, um, uh, last month Nobel Prize winner. So uh, I, I know the, it's a <clears throat> quite, quite an, a, a target that I have to strive for. As you um, mentioned, my biggest uh, uh, hobby is um, uh, autoimmunity and autoimmune liver disease. And if you want a quick summary of my talk and then want to listen for the next hour, this, this summary is in Journal Hepatology uh, one and a half years ago. And I will come back to that on the left side, the physiology on the right, the pathophysiology of autoimmunity in the liver. And before I will take you through these two uh, key situations, physiology and pathophysiology. I want to tell you a short story of uh, um, uh, that, that mixes my two hobbies. Um, Michelle mentioned that I also do infectious diseases and I'm interested in emerging infections. And we had a wonderful collaboration with uh, Fotis Sampatiotis in uh, Cambridge and it's primarily his work and Teresa Bravini's work It's a PhD student. Um, that I put at the beginning of my talk very briefly because uh, that paper was just accepted in Nature a couple of days ago and I, so I thought I'll, I'll let you know about this. Um, it is based on the observation um, that in organoid cultures of cholangiocytes, the receptor for the coronavirus is expressed, but it's only expressed if there's exposure to bile. That was already shown a year ago. Now, 
if you then um, look more closely, it is a chemodeoxycholic acid stimulating the FXR receptor that controls ACE2 expression. And consequently, if you give ursulase oxycholic acid, um, as uh, shown here and in, in blue, the receptor is downregulated again. And uh, another uh, FXR antagonist uh, does the same. So that, of course, opens interesting avenues. And um, <clears throat> therefore, what they did is they took um, organoids from lung, gallbladder organoids, and intestinal organoids. <clears throat> and treated them with keno or keno plus also this oxycholic acid. And the combination um, uh, of also prevented infection quite effectively. Um, I have to, sorry, I have to go find the laser pointer again. Okay, that should make it possible here to show the differences. Okay. Um, so they <clears throat> then went on to a, a in vitro, an ambitious in vitro experiment. These are two lungs from the same lung donor whose lungs couldn't be used for transplantation. And one of the lungs was uh, uh, perfused with uh, uh, additional ursodesoxycholic acid. And then they looked at the infection rate and the expression of the ACE2 receptor. And you can see how after six hours, the receptor is downregulated and the infection rate um, is reduced massively. And the, um, the, the contribution that we made is this uh, clinical study taking ursodeoxycholic acid um, in uh, six volunteers. Um, German doctors are allowed to do a try on themselves. That was a <laughs> medical legal part of this. And you can see, see the down regulation of the receptor quite rapidly and the up regulation after stopping ursodeoxycholic acid. The reason why we actually came together is very early in the pandemic, we did a study to see whether our patients are in danger with autoimmune liver diseases. We found and published that autoimmune hepatitis paper patients are not in danger. Their disease cause was just the same as with other patients, but we didn't really get enough data on PVC and PSC. Probably because they were protected from infection, we didn't have enough patients to report at the beginning of the pandemic about an infection. So this is very exciting and uh, uh, maybe another way, uh, an alternative to wearing masks uh, for uh, the future. Okay, let me turn to my key topic and the physiology and pathophysiology of autoimmunity intolerance in the liver. Under physiological conditions, the liver is a very optimistic organ. It reminds me of being in California. Everybody is optimistic and positive and tolerant. That's what the liver is. That's why I like the liver. That's why I like California. So the antigens that are of course, released daily. That's why we can measure transaminases in the blood because they are always liver cells uh, disintegrating, um, are taken taking up by, um, by antigen presenting cells presented to various cells, but primarily CD4 cells. And this is regulated further by T-Rex, but of course also by immune mediators. And the result that you normally get is tolerance. And I refer to a very old experiment by Sir Roy Kahn, who it's a, it's a classical experiment from the 60s, that if you do a liver transplant in a rat and you do a skin transplant in the rat, if you do both from the same donor, the skin is not rejected, even though the skin is highly immunogenic and is normally strongly rejected. Um, so the liver actually confers tolerance towards the skin graft. The liver as a tolerogenic organ, not only within the liver, but beyond the liver. And that will be um, my, my first uh, or my now second topic. So <clears throat> clinically, liver allografts require less immunosuppression than other organ grafts. They convey protection for other allografts. 
and this is also clinically known, if you do a, a liver kidney transplant, the kidneys are less rejected than if you do a kidney transplant on its own. Also experimental, again, all experimental data, if you inject antigen through the portal vein, you usually get tolerance. By you put it in a systemic vein, you get an immune reaction. And I strongly believe that viral hepatitis being such a universal infection is because the virus is protected in the liver from an immune attack. And um, uh, that is really the, the, the big population experiment in liver tolerance. And the reason for that is, sorry, that was too fast. <clears throat> There's an evolutionary need for this. The liver is exposed to a multitude of antigens, uh, probably more even than the other surfaces that have a, a, a surface protection, <laughs> the, out, the, the skin and the mucosa. But here, the antigens come through the portal blood, microbial antigens, food antigens, and the liver is the main producer of neoantigens because of its high metabolic activity. So whenever you take a drug and the drug is uh, metabolized, new antigens arise and uh, you don't want to react to these. <laughs> so already a long time ago, we looked at the characteristics of antigen presentation in the liver and could show that both Kupfer cells, but even more so the sinusoidal endothelial cells in the liver, are tolerogenic antigen presenting cells. They induce a Th2, which a leukin 4 kind of respond, a response, and no Th1 response. Um, following on from that, um, we try to break tolerance in the liver by making a transgenic mouse with myelin basic protein, which is a very strong autoantigen. It's the key autoantigen in all the MS studies, the experimental autoimmune encephalomyelitis model, the model for autoimmune liver disease, and immunize these mice with uh, complete foreign adjuvant uh, uh, MBP. And uh, these mice, as is shown here, are protected, completely protected. If we put the antigen, the transgene, the MBP transgene in the skin, there's no protection. So having the transgene in the liver um, <clears throat> protects against the most powerful autoantigen that we know. Um, <clears throat> how does this work? As expected and published uh, already many years ago, this is mediated again, primarily by regulatory T cells and you can transfer this protection by CD25 positive T cells. Um, uh, they are um, passive transfer protects the recipient mice from induction of experimental autoimmune encephalomyelitis. Um, and uh, if you uh, look at this uh, in vitro, the interaction of MBP specific T cells reacting to MBP presented by liver dendritic cells, sinusoidal cells, Kupfer cells, or splenic dendritic cells. You can sh show, or we could show, and Antonella Carambia was the key author in this, um, that you get a strong induction of regulatory T cells after presenting these antigens um, by liver sinusoidal endothelial cells. But even dendritic cells and Kupfer cells in the liver there may be some contamination, of course, with sinusoidal cells, are more heterogenic than dendritic cells from the spleen, for example. So we hypothesize or strongly believe that line, liver sinusoidal endothelial cells are really key in inducing tolerance, the physiological tolerance in the liver. Um, and in fact, uh, again, these uh, <coughs> T cells. Um, stimulated in vitro on liver sinusoidal endothelial cells are sufficient to suppress by passive transfer induction of experimental autoimmune encephalomyelitis. The mechanism is probably, there are probably multiple mechanisms, but one key mechanism is TGF-beta, because if we do the same experiment with T cells, that have a dominant negative TGF-beta type 2 receptor, these T cells do not become regulatory T cells. Uh, so antigen presenting uh, presentation by liver sinusoidal endothelial cells 
to these T cells is not able to induce FOX3 positive regulatory T cells. And indeed, um, the, uh, the sinusoidal endothelial cells are producing TGF beta. They're both secreting it and they have it as shown in this fax analysis on the surface. So both membrane bound TGF beta as well as secreted TGF beta, probably both factors are important in enabling sinusoidal endothelial cells for tolerogenic um, antigen presentation and induction of regulatory T cells. So that of course makes it attractive to try and use the sinusoidal endothelial cells as inducers of tolerance. So the concept that we developed and Johannes Herkel is the strongest driver in our group uh, pushing this forward is trying to put antigens into the sinusoidal endothelial cells and the vehicle that we now use is of course not really transgene if you want it in human therapy, but putting it into nanoparticles and that way inducing um, tolerance uh, and probably uh, being able to treat autoimmune diseases. So we've produced these to our, with, together with our chemists, produced these various nanoparticles. Normal nanoparticles are taken up primarily by macrophages and kupfer cells, but it depends on the charge and the size of these. And you can generate uh, ones that are specifically taken up by sinusoidal endothelial cells. Here's just shown that they uh, go to the liver very quickly within one hour you see 90 percent or 80 percent of the nanoparticles already in the liver and um, they are then located uh, together uh, with uh, dextran so they they located at the in the sinusoidal endothelial cells in the liver so <clears throat> there is a, a lot of specificity specificity in this targeting and that indeed does have the effect that we are wishing for in various models now of experimental autoimmune uh, um, encephalomyelitis here in two different uh, strains. And the TG4 strain is actually a strain with a, a transgenic T cell receptor. So very strong immune response against M MBP in these mice. You can almost completely abrogate the disease by giving these particles prior to disease induction. And you can even um, uh, dampen the disease quite decisively after induction by giving the nanoparticles uh, uh, during um, the disease. And um, it doesn't, it's not specific to MBP. Uh, MOC, which is the other autoantigen used for the encephalomyelitis model in black six mice, um, you get the same effect if you use uh, mock, nano, mock peptide loaded nanoparticles as the therapy. So we believe that we can use the liver to induce tolerance outside the liver and believe this could be a future treatment for autoimmune diseases. Here is shown that the particles are only given on day 10 and the positive effect uh, of uh, giving the particles during disease in induction and development. This is a clinical score for those of you uh, who've not worked with EAE. The score of four is actually the, the, the mice are dead. Um, uh, and the score of two is, uh, is um, uh, that one is weaker li limb movement. Uh, two is the hind limb, limbs don't move anymore. Three, three is quadriplegic. So this is quite a severe disease and a, a marked clinical difference. If you take the relative change since giving the um, nanoparticles, you can see that it's quite a, a quick effect that lasts for the two months of the observation period um, that, we, that we had. So um, there's strong hope that this is really therapeutically useful. Um, again, we could show that this is mediated by T-Rex cells, and if you deplete T-Rex cells, the effect is gone. Um, and of course, this has been patented and is now being followed up by a, a company, Topper Therapeutics, which was founded on that principle. 
and is now conducting the first human trials, not in MS because it's such a complicated disease to study with so many alternative uh, drugs in, in testing, but in PEMFIGUS where we know a specific antigen and it will be uh, studied in celiac disease probably next year. So uh, we are very optimistic on that. So <clears throat> this is about tolerance. Now let's go to autoimmune hepatitis. And I told you, I. I like being optimistic. I like the liver because it's so tolerant. And I've always been interested in not just why does somebody get autoimmune hepatitis, but why isn't autoimmune hepatitis worse than it is? Why can you live for many years before, before you really have a problem? Why do people who have a genetic predisposition um, go through life for 60 years healthy and then they forget their first bout? So what are the regulatory mechanisms? Um, uh, involved because I believe uh, they can help us to, to, to develop more specific treatment. Now, we try to break tolerance in the liver and the first failure I already told you about and that, that, that developed a, a novel treatment for autoimmune disease. We try to get stronger by taking mice um, that are transgenic for an LCMV specific peptide T cell receptor, um, and then use the same peptide as an antigen. So it's not a self antigen, it's a foreign antigen, and put that uh, um, transgenically in either hepatocytes, macrophages, in the C cells, or the drutic cells in the liver. And that was uh, uh, by Max Preti. Uh, uh, primarily done in Johannes Hackel's group and uh, published last year. Um, and that for the first time enabled us uh, to get some degree of hepatitis, but only in the model where we have a selective expression in, in, in hepatocytes, because as you can see, if you express it in, um, in macrophages or in dendritic cells, you get almost complete deletion of the antigen specific T cells in the thymus. If you express it in endothelial cells, and this repeats our previous findings, um, you get some deletion in the thymus, but primarily you get a peripheral um, deletion or suppression of uh, these T cells. While in expression in the hepatos hepatocytes allows survival of these antigen uh, specific transgenic T cells, and uh, they indeed then cause uh, hepatitis, um, uh, which uh, they don't cause by the antigen itself. So if you put it in a, in a mouse that does not have uh, the T cells with a transgenic T cell receptor for that peptide, the mice remain healthy. If you combine transgenic expression of the peptide in hepatocytes and the T cell receptor uh, transgenic mice, you indeed get an inflammation. It doesn't look exactly like the autoimmune hepatitis that we see clinically, but there clearly is a, a marked lymphocyte infiltration. They even develop anti-nuclear antibodies for various characteristics of an autoimmune hepatitis. And again, we believe that T-Rex make, make the difference. If you express the antigen in the endothelial cells, you have marked uh, um, de development of regulatory T cells with specificity uh, for this peptide, while in the albumin transgenic uh, antigen uh, mice, we see very few regulatory T cells. So is autoimmune hepatitis a lack of regulatory T cells? That's a problem that uh, Marcial Seebode, who is here, and uh, Moritz Peisler already studied 10 years ago in our group and looked at regulatory T cells in autoimmune hepatitis. Many people have looked at that with slightly different results in different labs. We find an increase of regulatory T cells in the inflamed tissue, but presumably we have an increase of all the lymphocytes. So it's a, um, uh, it, it is a, a relative, um, situation. So it's not just a lack. Um, clearly, it's not a lack of uh, regulatory C cells. Also, we can show that they have uh, uh, regulatory activity in vitro. Um, so it's not as simple as that, that uh, sort of a lack of regulatory T cells in the liver causes autoimmune hepatitis. 
we find more a lack of regular GC cells in primary sclerosis and cholangitis, but that would be uh, going too far um, today. And <coughs> a very old slide that I, I originally made to show how important the test for SLALP antigen, uh, because we cloned that uh, 30 years ago and then developed the, the, the diagnostic assays and many patients who are negative for other autoantibodies are only positive for SLALP. So this was a patient who had repeated bouts of, uh, of an acute hepatitis. And because he was an elderly man, everybody said this is probably drug induced because everybody above 60 takes some drugs. So probably everybody takes some drugs during the past six months. So you always make up the story. The reason why I'm showing this example is the up and down spontaneously before you give immunotherapy. Again, this is my repeated message. There are a lot of regulatory activities going on in the liver, even in autoimmune hepatitis, and they prevent that most of our patients actually have fulminant. Some do, but the vast majority have fluctuating disease or um, uh, slow uh, disease. Um, and one of the players here, again, is TGF-beta. Again, a very old paper of ours showing TGF-beta and uh, immunohistology and also in cytohybridization. And, and wherever there were inflammatory infiltrates in the liver, you saw overexpression of TGF-beta. Um, so the, the liver or the immune system is trying to stop the inflammation. But of course, the price that you pay for um, uh, stopping the inflammation is scar formation. TGF-beta is a key player in, in, in scar formation. And we know that we get these enormous uh, scar formation in autoimmune hepatitis. And this is just to show another hobby of ours, which is actually that we like, love to look at the liver by laparoscopy. And then we can actually see this because if you do a biopsy in one of these big nodules, you may not see the cirrhosis because the nodule, the regenerative nodule is so big that you may, may miss it. And we, we've shown that in about 25% of the patients, you miss cirrhosis if you just do standard transcutaneous um, biopsy. The other advantage, it's easier to do additional biopsies for research. And I already promised Michelle, I will take, I will, I will show a couple of old data. This is the last piece of old data I think I'm, I'm, I'm showing. Um, <clears throat> demonstrating this, regulatory response. That was a, a, a paper we did 27 years ago. We took patients with a new diagnosis of autoimmune hepatitis prior to starting immunosuppression and looked as how do they respond to a vaccine? Now a very relevant question. <laughs> we wanted them vaccinated prior to giving immunosuppression. That's what we always say to our patients, try to get your vaccine updated and uh, because the new suppression may have a weaker response. And all of us forget an update on their tetanus vaccine after 10 years, you should have one. So it wasn't so difficult to recruit patients to do a tetanus uh, vaccine. And here first is shown the normal T cell response after the tetanus vaccine in the control, had the control group in viral hepatitis uh, patients. But then if you look at uh, autoimmune liver diseases, PBC does that very well in autoimmune hepatitis. None of them responded. That was, I mean, I had the hypothesis that there is spontaneous immunosuppression. I didn't expect that to be such a marked effect. And now we come to COVID-19 vaccines. <laughs> and uh, as we've published, there's uh, um, a weaker response of the autoimmune hepatitis patients to the COVID uh, vaccines. We, we, we have the two mRNA vaccines that we used in Germany. And this is a logarithmic scale, so it doesn't look quite as marked as there is a, a clear difference. So the patients do respond, but the response is much weaker. It's also weaker compared with autoimmune hepatitis uh, with PVC and PSC patients. And it is also much weaker if you look at the T cell response. Um, if you look at a, a T cell response, only half the patients have a significant T cell response after the vaccination, um, while uh, three quarters, at least three quarters of the control group have a strong T cell response. But intriguingly, again, it was independent of whether the patients got immunosuppressive therapy or not, which is contrary to what we normally tell our patients. So the patients with autoimmune hepatitis without immunosuppressive therapy had 
the same weakened response to the vaccination as um, did uh, uh, the patients with immunosuppressive therapy. Conversely, there's no reason not to vaccinate our patients just because they're receiving immunosuppressive therapy. And that is the encouraging uh, uh, piece of news. If you do a third vaccination, almost all of them go up nicely. Um, so our patients with autoimmune hepatitis, they do respond. They, the response is somehow weakened. This seems to be independent of, um, of the immunosuppressive um, treatment. There may be some influences, of course, if you have very high doses, MMF seems to be more suppressive. Uh, they are more specific on that. But generally, yes, they respond, but even the ones without treatment have a weaker response and we have to watch them. So I come back to the various factors that may um, be related to active autoimmunity. Maybe decreased regulatory T cell activity, uh, increased expression of inflammatory cytokines, TNF and interferon um, gamma. Um, but there are a lot of other, other cells we haven't really been looking at yet in sufficient detail to know their roles. We have known for, for right from the beginning of autoimmune hepatitis, there is a genetic background, um, an HLR background, which is very marked. Um, and it's very likely that external extrinsic triggers like infections or the gut microbiome or drugs or metabolites are the triggers that start and drive the disease. But of course, we still have to look at all the other places, which are the dominant antigens and autoantigens. Uh, what is the functional state of the antigen presenting cells? What is the role of autoantibodies? Um, and uh, each of these aspects, of course, gives us opportunities of therapeutic intervention. Anti-CD20, uh, anti-CD19 has been propagated by some. Um, I'm not a great fan of that because I don't believe this is a B-cell mediated disease, but of course B-cells are also antigen presenting cells, so it has some effect. Um, and uh, the same is true for impairment of regulatory T cells where we are expecting clinical trials, hopefully augmenting this. The person who actually put me into hepatology was Sheila Sherlock, where I was a, a medical student, and uh, that was sort of my, uh, my, my final push in, into that subject. I was one of the last medical students of the mother of hepatology, Sheila Sherlock, and that's why I'm showing one of these three classical trials on autoimmune hepatitis. Treatment is life-saving. So now I come to the clinical part of my talk. Um, treatment is life-saving. Um, and <laughs> This is also a reminder that non-treatment is deadly. Three quarters of the, of the patients have died in the placebo group after five years. So it's a serious disease. And key, of course, is making the diagnosis. Now we put forward uh, in the International Autoimmune Hepatitis Group these simplified diagnostic criteria, um, which have helped a lot trying to identify patients, but they do have several weaknesses. One of the weaknesses is the autoantibody testing. Um, it's uh, very, uh, I, I would say, or has been very European influenced by the immunofluorescence testing that we love to do. And most of us, I myself too, have grown up doing these immunofluorescence testing on uh, um, red tissue sections and uh, uh, screening for these autoantibodies. We missed SLALP because it's not detectable by immunofluorescence and only when we had the ELISA and immunoglot testing, testing for SLALP could we complete that. But some of the patients may test negative. And I don't know how you do it at UCSF, but uh, most of the US uses ELISA tests for autoantibodies. And is that legitimate or not? A lot of people in the community would say this is scandalous. And we did that study last year, comparing immunofluorescence testing and ELISA testing. And to our surprise found that both test principles are comparable. They have their own weaknesses and strength. Not only that immunofluorescence requires a, a, a skilled and motivated technician because it's a subjective test, um, but uh, also you look at different antigens. So, well-performed immunofluorescence testing 
is better for anti-nuclear antibodies um, uh, than ELISA. With smooth muscle antibodies, and especially F-actin antibodies, ELISA is performing surprisingly well. You can see here it's performing better than um, immunofluorescence testing. But what surprised us was when we did the study, it didn't surprise us that much, is it very much depends on your local lab um, and your local control group. So when we put in the guidelines fixed levels and say it has to be more than 180, more than 160, or uh, uh, ELISA of 20 units or something, I'm afraid you have to talk to your lab and you have to know your local cutoff values to know what is the significance of the autoantibody? We only talk about ANA positive, SMA positive. That is too simple. Um, and uh, on the basis of that, we have sort of uh, tried to, 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 to specify um, uh, cutoff levels, but they need to be looked at locally. And the other topic in the diagnostic criteria we have addressed uh, recently is the histology. Um, in that classical paper, we said there have to be typical features of autoimmune hepatitis or compatible features. And as typical, we wrote things um, like um, M-periprolesis um, that have actually never stood the test of time. They are related to the severity of liver disease, not to the cause of liver disease. But because autoimmune hepatitis, when it presents, often is quite severe, it was seen more frequently there. So uh, that is uh, work that was uh, done largely again by uh, Marcia Seebode, who is here, um, addressing particularly the question of the differentiation between drug-induced liver injury and acute autoimmune hepatitis. Because I think all of us, we have been seeing more patients with acute autoimmune hepatitis. Um, but they don't, did not fulfill the diagnostic criteria that we had thus far, uh, because we said centrilobular hepatitis is not a feature of autoimmune hepatitis, but clinically we know it can well be. Uh, and that's why we got together a group of international expert pathologists, and Chanza uh, Kaka from UCSF uh, was very helpful in that group uh, as well, and put forward, uh, published earlier this year, um, new diagnostic criteria for the histology of autoimmune hepatitis. Now, in portal hepatitis, there is less discussion, but also lobular hepatitis. And I would like to draw your attention to this cartoon on the, on the right side, where you have no portal hepatitis, but just have central lobular and lobular hepatitis. You can indeed have, uh, make a diagnosis of possible autoimmune hepatitis. So it doesn't mean that the histology actually makes the diagnosis. It's only together that we can make the diagnosis. And often it is just a, a possible diagnosis. We give steroids, we see the response, and then we stop the steroids, we see a relapse, then we know it's autoimmune hepatitis. We don't see a relapse, then we know it could have been an offending, offending drug. Um, but it's uh, very important that we keep our eyes open for this differential diagnosis because these are the patients who need therapy urgently and uh, uh, therefore just waiting um, can be a problem. Standard therapy for decades now has been, and our guideline has been steroids are the drug of choice for induction of remission. That was the old trial. They were just steroid monotherapy. Azathioprine, the drug of choice for maintenance of remission. And the target is full biochemical remission. And indeed, if you have full biochemical remission, normal transaminases and normal IgG, you don't need a follow-up biopsy that is sufficiently informative. But what is the reality? Marcel Seebode looked at that in Germany. I'm sure it's the same in the US. If you look at what do our patients actually receive, only few of them receive azathioprine. Quite a lot of them continue receiving steroids for a long time, whether it's prednisolone or budesonide. Um, so everyday life for patients looks quite different to the guidelines. If you really, and that's another piece of good news, if you really achieve full biochemical remission, Johannes Hartel did this paper, then you get regression of fibrosis. Um, here measured by fibroscan, um, why, 
If you manage PBC very well, you have stable disease. With PSC, I'm afraid you have progressive disease. So that's encouraging, but again, something that uh, has been reported again and again, if you fail to achieve biochemical remission, and I remind you of the TGF beta expression as one mechanism, then actually you have progression of fibrosis. So trying to achieve biochemical remission is a very good clinical treatment aim. <laughs> but we often have problems. If you have response, that's fine, but if you have insufficient response or intolerance, and that's something that we have addressed from this uh, European reference network for liver diseases, together with the International Autoimmune Hepatitis Group, that we've tried to give an algorithm how to proceed if you don't achieve what you want to achieve, and try to do that in a standardized fashion and hopefully eventually report the results in a standardized fashion, because we only have these case areas and find it very difficult to really know um, what we should be doing. One key aspect that I believe in increasingly is actually that we need to measure azathioprine metabolites and <clears throat> based on one paper I will show in a second, we say the level should be more than 220. Um, if, if it's <clears throat> high level and you don't have a, a sufficient response, exclude alternative diagnosis and then uh, uh, intensify therapy. Sorry, this is a sensitive screen here. If the levels are low, address compliance. I mean, we know from hypertension and so on how many patients actually do take their drug every day. Um, but there is an, a way of improving um, optimal 6-GGN levels in, in, in patients, depending on what kind of metabolizers they are. There's a high heterogeneity. If you give allopurinol, you increase by a factor of two to four, the levels of 6-TGN, which is the active metabolite of azathioprine or 6-MP, whichever drug you use. I know in the US you like 6-MP a lot also, and decrease the toxic methyl mercaptopurin nucleotides. Um, so that can be very elegant to achieve uh, a stable remission. But if you look at the original data of that paper on which this is based, there isn't such a marked difference between the remission and non-remission and the 220 cutoff. It's a bit arbitrary. So don't take it as a dogma, uh, look at it individually. Uh, and you may have patients not in remission with high 6-TGN levels and vice versa. Still, it's a, an important step. If this doesn't work, um, or if you have intolerance and even MMF doesn't work, then is a justification to do third line therapy. That could be a talk in itself. I would just briefly mention that we have always been great fans of anti-TNF as a, as a treatment. This is from uh, our 10 year old paper in journal hepatology on these very difficult to treat autoimmune hepatitis patients, most of whom respond very nicely. In fact, we've seen some wonderful fibrosis regression in anti TNF treated uh, patients, and some of them we've been treating for 20 years now. Um, and now we're going to back to um, laboratory data again a paper we've just submitted, looking primarily at the difference between PBC and autoimmune hepatitis and the immunoprofiling. I don't expect you to read all this and trying to see what, uh, what is the characteristics of variant syndrome patients. Um, you can see at the first sight that there are a lot of immune mediators that are increased in autoimmune hepatitis and less so in, in, in PBC and variant syndromes are in between. Um, but uh, the, the, the aspect that I would like to stress here is that it's TNF, interferon gamma, IL-10, and TGF-beta, which are the main factors that are different in autoimmune hepatitis compared to PBC, and also different in variant syndromes in between the autoimmune hepatitis and the PBC group. And if we do... <clears throat> Single cell analysis in the liver, and these are preliminary studies uh, that are done uh, presently in Nicola Galliani's lab um, in our hospital. And if we look specifically at the CD4 uh, T cells, um, then we see again interferon gamma, TNF, and IL 10. IL 10 is interesting because it's immunosuppressive, but it's also the key regulator for high IgG levels. And we believe that 
the hyperimmunoglobulinemia, which often in the acute autoimmune hepatitis you don't see, you don't see yet because you don't have the regulatory response yet, and it only comes up later on. So that fits very well. And the IL-17, which we long time believed was very important, is not the key factor. This is very preliminary, and we have to follow that up in the future. Um, at the end, a very brief word about our European reference network. We are proud of this because once we have something that the US does not have it yet, we hope we will have it soon. It's a collaborative effort across Europe of expert centers looking at autoimmune, uh, at, at rare liver diseases, and autoimmune liver diseases are rare liver diseases, but also at pediatric, biliary atresia, and so on. And one of the projects we're doing there is uh, the first prospective study, registered study of um, liver diseases, uh, in particular autoimmune, but also others. This is a registry. We have now have 1,400 patients in this registry for the autoimmune hepatitis patients that include the pediatric population. It gives you a good uh, age distribution. Patients are only included if their diagnosis is less than 12 years, uh, 12 months old, so fresh diagnosis. Um, uh, and a sobering fact from the first analysis, how many of the patients have actually achieved remission after one year or six months? Um, you can see that quite a few still have elevated and transaminases, IgG levels. And if you do the combined endpoint of IgG and transaminases, only 60% of our patients have full remission after one year. These are the realistic numbers in expert centers. It's different from what we normally used to say in our lectures. Very final point, depression in our patients. Many of our patients with autoimmune hepatitis have depressive symptoms. Christoph Schampa is that 10 years ago. Um, Patients are worse than cancer patients, some aspect that we haven't been addressing enough. And a, a paper that just come out uh, two weeks ago online that we did in our reference network with an online service of patients trying to see what is an influence of um, uh, the decreased quality of life. We did also look at PBC and, uh, and, and PSC. Um, and PSE patients did, did, did even worse. But what was interesting is, for example, are they being managed in a transplant center? So that's an advantage that you have. Patients feel much better if they are being managed at a transplant center across all three diseases. And the variable that we can influence, and that's the encouragement at the end of the talk, it's your doctor-patient relationship. The treatment conferences improves quality of life and look at all these various parameters. How would you describe the care provided by your liver team? Excellent, then you're feeling much better. Poor, you know, this is what we put at the standards. How can, easy can you reach your doctor? I know my doctor very well. My doctor knows me as a person. My doctor really cares about me. I feel totally relaxed with my doctor. All of these questions have a very strong influence on the quality of life of our patients. So we can really make a difference. So with that appeal, I would like to summarize. Under physiological conditions, the liver favors immunological tolerance. The key cellular basis for immune tolerance are sinusoidal endothelial cells and the key mediators, IL-10 and TGF-beta. And even in autoimmune liver disease, these regulatory factors act. They ameliorate inflammation, but they enhance fibrogenesis. And the final message, good management of autoimmune hepatitis requires careful diagnosis, individualized therapy, and a good doctor-patient relationship. Thank you very much for your attendance. Thank you so much, Ansgar. Thank you, Anskar, for that wonderful talk. Um, at this point, we can take some questions, um, either verbally or through the chat. And, oh yeah, okay, Holger, do you have a question?
I will repeat the question for the online audience. The question is whether we uh, had the chance to look at sinusoidal endothelial in fibrosis because they undergo changes in fibrosis. And indeed, no, we haven't looked at that in detail. We have primarily looked at these factors um, in vitro. And of course, they are changed their characteristics in vitro already. Um, and it will be, I think the key will be the, the these clinical mouse trial that we have done with the tolerogenic function, does it also work in a, in a cirrhotic mouse um, uh, that, uh, that we haven't done so far? I think it's a very relevant question. I think it's, it's also a relevant question whether they change, and I'm sure they do change if the inflammatory milieu is different. So um, if there are a lot of, uh, like in acute viral hepatitis, uh, 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 pro-inflammatory cytokines, that character may change, but it's been very difficult in vitro to change their character. So it's just a very strong tolerogenic um, tendency that they have. Great, uh, Dr. Maher. You mean you, you mean the LCMV peptide uh, mice? We didn't we, we didn't do that, no. But it, in fact, um, uh, a, an autoimmune cholangitis model is easier. Um, we have a couple of autoimmune cholangitis models um, uh, that work quite reliably. So, uh, for probably very good reasons, it's easier uh, um, to to cause inflammation directed against cholangiocytes than against hepatocytes. And incidentally, I didn't show you we did. Also, in a model that is a CD8 mediated cholangitis mouse model, we could use the same nanoparticle therapy to prevent that inflammation. Um, so it also works with CD8 cells and it also works in the cholangiocyte directed autoimmune reaction. Okay, so. Um... Sandia has brought my attention to the, to the time, and there's another group waiting for this Zoom room, but maybe we have time for just the last question, which we're receiving over Zoom from Jay Gardner. Um, and he says, thank you for the wonderful talk. One small question. Uh, I'm surprised by the difference in CRP versus K5-driven MBP result in the EAE experiments. Oh, this isn't a real short question, but um, okay, K5. I can provide a short yeah, okay. I, I think I can provide a short answer. Mm -hmm. I think the key is you need a selective expression of the antigen in the sinusoidal endothelial cells. As soon as you have it somewhere else, you will also have it in the thymus and you don't have the, uh, the, the regulatory uh, response. Great. Thank you so much, Ansgar. This was fantastic.